Hello, I'm Rochelle Mee Chapman, and this is Relig-ish, where we help you create right fit spiritual practices. We've been doing a series on sex and faith here at Religious, and this week we're going to press pause on that series because it would be very remiss of me as a minister and a care provider to not address the Trayvon Martin story this week. In my post-church eclectic religious faith, I am entirely convinced that the message of Jesus is a message of equity and justice above all else. And so when we see a situation in which um, equity and justice is not well served, it is our responsibility to address that as um, teachers and to address that as people of faith and to discipline ourselves to look into an uncomfortable situation, to learn from new sources and to be humble learners in this big cultural question. At the end of each episode of Religious, I ask you to do three things. I ask you to get curious, to trust your gut, and to live from a place of love. And this week, I'd like to take that first charge, get curious, and use it as a tool for engaging with the Trayvon Martin story. And I have a series of questions I'd like you to ask yourself as part of your spiritual practice this week. The first is, Am I using, well, it was the justice system's call to avoid difficult feelings about the Trayvon Martin case and to avoid the discipline of learning about your own complicit prejudice and privilege? It's very easy for us to just say, we have a system in place. The system said that Zimmerman is innocent. That solves it. There was no racial bias here. There was, it wasn't because Trayvon was black. It was totally fair for Zimmerman to stand his ground. And we can take that judgment and say, we have a system, the system worked. I don't have to think about this. I don't have to engage with this. I don't have to think about my own privilege. If you're watching this as a person, a white person, which most of my viewers and readers are nice white ladies. So we're gonna go with that we can default to the system as a scapegoat. But if we're even remotely educated about way, the way the legal and justice system works in America, we know that it is incredibly prejudiced against people of color. The statistics are clear on that. And we know that often there is a miscarriage of justice even within the justice system. So we can't just say that a juror decided it and now I don't have to think about it anymore, now I don't have to engage with it anymore. Because even if you think that the judgment was fair, the reality of race, violence, guns, and prejudice in our culture still is there. So please ask yourself with all honesty, am I using the juror's decision, am I using the justice system as a reason to escape engaging with difficult questions around race in America. The next question I think we should ask ourselves is, am I denying my own place of privilege out of fear of losing power? I don't see this as much among white women as I do among white men, but there is a deep impulse to deny our place of privilege in society. And I think part of that is because we don't know how to change that role of privilege, but part of it too is a fear of losing power if we should acknowledge privilege and seek to create more equity societally. So am I denying my own privilege out of fear of losing power? Another question that we can ask ourselves is as, am I confusing compassion with solidarity? I had a conversation on my Facebook page this week uh, in which I was expressing solidarity with Trayvon Martin's family. And one of my commenters said, what about Zimmerman? Don't you have any place to express solidarity with him and with his loss and the way he's been portrayed and um, the way this has impacted his life? And I think what was happening there is the commenter was confusing compassion with solidarity. Yes, you can have compassion for the tragedy that's going on through this whole story, the way that it's hurting so many people. 
but solidarity with an aggressor is not required for compassion. So am I confusing solidarity with compassion? Another question is, um, am I co-opting the pain of another? So there's this trend going on right now where people are saying, I am Trayvon's mother, and sort of a, trying to uh, acknowledge that any of us who are mothers have children out there in a violent society and we're all responsible for making changes in that society. But there is sort of a co-opting of the story when the nice white lady comes in and says, I am Trayvon's mother. So I think we need to think about our language, about how we express solidarity, how we express care, how we express compassion, and make sure that we're being respectful of whose story this is and who has ownership of the story. Another good question to get curious about is, are my spiritual practices expanding my capacity for being present to suffering? A lot of times when something tragic like this happens, we, we fall back on the, well, I'll pray for you, I'm thinking of you. And those aren't bad things to do. And depending on um, how you understand prayer and energy and thought and care, those things may actually have a powerful effect in the world. However, we can fall back on those things as sort of a trite saying when we don't know what else to do. Sometimes they're powerful acts and sometimes they're just a fallback. So a good question to get curious about is, are my spiritual practices helping me engage with this situation, with the story of Trayvon, with the racism in our culture, with the brokenness of our justice system? Or are they just a shadow comfort that's helping me feel better because I said I'm praying for you or I'm thinking of you? And what practices might better serve us? Perhaps the spiritual practice of study um, might serve us better in this situation by reading articles by black authors and thought leaders. Perhaps the discipline of Tonglen meditation, which is a meditative practice that helps us expand capacity for pain and expand capacity for healing, might be a more effective spiritual practice. So it's a good time to say, are my spiritual practices helping expand my capacity to be present to this situation? And finally, I think a good question for all of us to ask ourselves is, am I willing to stand in the struggle? The challenge of these great earthquakes that rock us societally is that the next one's going to come at lightning speed. Um, there's a mass shooting and then there's a terrible flood. There's this difficult and I think unjust ruling around the Trayvon Martin story. And then what will come next? another terrible racial case of injustice. We barely have time to be present to one story before the next story hits us. And so we numb out, we avoid them, we throw up our hands, we say we can't change, make change. So am I willing to stand in the suffering? Am I willing to stand in the discomfort? Am I willing to keep learning, to keep trying, to keep engaging with possibilities? It's a difficult place to be because solutions don't come quickly. And it's very easy to just opt out. So remaining in the struggle is an important part of our spiritual discipline when it comes to living a life of equity and justice, the life of Christ, the life of love, the life of compassion in our society. So those are some of the questions that I'm getting curious about for myself this week that I'm curious about for um, the people who comment on my Facebook and my blog, especially for the men. Again, I'm seeing a lot of unacknowledged white privilege amongst my white brothers. Um, and um, I think we need to stay in the struggle and we need to keep learning. So I know for me that I need to continue to educate myself about um, the experience of black families in a predominantly white culture and what that means for their children, especially for their boys, what that means about a foreshortening of childhood for their children, what that means about fear of doing the most basic things like, say, watering a neighbor's plants when they're gone and being a dark-skinned kid out in somebody else's yard, as opposed to being a light-skinned kid watering somebody else's yard. I need to read stories about this. I need to read um, prominent black thinkers. I need to learn. So I'm going to share with you the list of articles that I'm reading this week. Most of them have come to me through my friend Michael Dumas, who um, 
is a great thought leader in this arena. And I hope that you'll join me in expanding our understanding of how our culture works and how our role as people of privilege in that culture works. If you are a person of color who's watching this today, I thank you for doing so. I don't have very many viewers uh, outside of my own color block, so to speak. And I hope that you will share with us your experience of the Trayvon Martin story. Help us to learn. We want to be humble learners and um, tell us how we can partner. We know that your cultures are wise and rich in ways that ours are not. And we would like to learn from you. So thank you all for being here today. I hope that you can receive the words that I'm speaking in this very highly charged situation in the way that I had intended them, which is um, out of compassion and a desire to bring healing and shalom into our culture. So until we meet again, I hope that you will get curious, that you will trust your gut, and that whatever you do, you will live from a place of love. Amen. Amen.